I have to tell you, like I have been at home for the last two and a half years, and I've been really, really comfortable at home. And then I just took one step off the train today, and I walked. Uh, I had, yeah, I had four shots of espresso. Uh, that may have helped uh, as well. But when I walked in here, I just felt the energy. I felt the energy returning, uh, and it's good to be back. Now, for all of you that are uh, online right now, I was once you. Uh, I, was, I was virtual too. Uh, I want you to put your phone down. I want you to put on some clothes. And I want you to focus on me. My phone's nowhere to be seen. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun. And I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, yeah, some thoughts on affiliate. You're the experts. You know, I'm, I'm the outsider. I'm the ignoramus. Uh, but that doesn't stop me from having an opinion. And, uh, and, and actually, I say that in a somewhat self-deprecating way, but I think actually one, there's, there's a lesson in, even in that, which is sometimes we get so close to, we get so close to what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, even getting comfortable being at home, and, and we need to sometimes zoom out and take a step back and really realize the power of being able to be uh, present, but also the power of uh, perspective. Now, I'm thrilled to be here. It is my first actual in-person keynote since this whole crazy thing happened. I've stayed away from it. I've even priced myself away from it. Um, and uh, it may be my last one as well, which will be revealed shortly. There's actually a reason why I even say that. But it's a tremendous, I feel, honor and a responsibility to be an opening keynote because you get to set the tone and set the context for what is to come. So I hope to be thought-provoking as opposed to provocative. I hope to stretch, I hope to challenge. Uh, you can challenge me back as well if there's time left over for questions, which there probably won't be, but I'm sticking around throughout the day and I'll be here during the networking session to answer any questions. Remember, X says no hugs, uh, otherwise you're getting a big hug uh, from me uh, as well. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, a really, really exciting day. Now, I describe myself now in terms of BP and AP. Does anyone want to take a guess what BP and AP stands for? Before pandemic and after pandemic, you know? Before pandemic, I was a five-time author, uh, a, a keynote speaker. I'd spoken in 50 countries, started multiple companies, serial entrepreneur, blah, 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 blah. Everything changed, the cupboard was bare, and literally, you know, <laughs> I wasn't special. I was the same as every, well, maybe I, <laughs> you were more special, you had jobs, uh, but suddenly the cupboard was bare, and uh, I knew I needed to change something, and I will talk about that change in a moment. How do I describe this moment? Well, uh, here's one way. Meet Negan Smith. Now, Negan Smith, before the pandemic, was a high school coach. He was a, a coach at a high school. But after pandemic, of course, we all know him as Negan, the bloodthirsty cult leader. And that is Lucille for all you Walking Dead fans. Now, I actually have Lucille at home. I ordered Lucille. Uh, if I could have, I would have brought the bat in with me. Uh, it's not a real bat. It's like the, you know, the... Uh, the, the barbed wire is kind of plastic as well. But I was just so excited to be on Metro North today with this bat in my hand. I'm not going to hit you over the head, um, but I'm in, instead going to talk to you about the power of the pivot. I became a talk show host. I didn't set out to be a talk show host. If you actually saw my show, you'd probably realize that I'm not a talk show host um, as evidenced by my good friend, uh, Penn Gillette. Hi, this is Penn. Penn Gillette, Penn and Teller. Big guy does magic, small guy next to me. He does magic too. He doesn't talk that much. I want to talk about uh, Joseph Jaffe is not famous. And Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Joseph Jaffe is wicked not famous. Joseph Jaffe is superlatively not famous, and for good and sufficient reason. I mean, maybe his guests 
are famous. Maybe his guests are famous. He gets some famous people on his guests, but Joseph Jaffe himself is not famous. That's the important part. You can have famous guests and still not be famous. And if you want an example of that, well, Joseph Jaffe would be a really good example. Teller would do a better job at a talk show, and Teller doesn't talk, which you'd think would be one of the major qualification being on a talk show <laughs> and not being famous. What's that teller? Oh yeah, teller says. Joseph Jaffe, not famous. Love you. Peace. Now look, we're all friends here, so I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The power of cameo, by the way. <laughs> we're not, you know, <laughs> this is Penn and I, we're best of friends. That's Penn, that's myself uh, as well. I started a show called Corona TV because I wanted to poke the bear. I wanted to find hope, positivity, and optimism from a moment of despair to help people that were stuck or stuck at home or just stuck in general. Um, and I've later rebranded it as Joseph Jaffe is not famous. Yesterday, I had guest number 401. I've had Seth Godin. I've had Philip Kotler. I've had Dr. Robin D'Angelo, Dan Pink, Jamal Mashburn, James Rollins. Uh, apparently Greg Coleman is coming on the show at some point. He just doesn't know it yet uh, as well. Here is a little intro uh, from the show. Woody hoo! <laughs> Woody hoo! <laughs> <laughs> Out here in the stream, I fight for my dreams. I get my heart into my living. Do you, you encourage drinking or, or marijuana use on the show? I don't need a fight, cause Evelyn's right. Or you could sponsor an emu. Uh... I'm Batman. That's your tweetable comedian. moment, folks. That's your tweetable <laughs> moment. If Mark Zuckerberg makes a metaverse, is that Web3? No, it's Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. He's like us. He's flawed. Just a little segue. That's some dope shit, dude. That's really, really nice. Woody hoo! <laughs> Woody hoo! <laughs> and 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 that you know is part of my flawed journey uh, to manifest becoming the Daily Show for business. That was 2020. So in 2020, I reinvented myself. In 2021, I set out to reinvent the talk show in the streaming era. But then something happened. Two things happened. One I thought was good, and one was definitely not good. Turns out both were actually bad. I'm one of the few people that can honestly say 2021 sucked way, way harder than 2020. Uh, the first is I got a creator coin. I got my own cryptocurrency. I thought this was, was a good thing until about six months ago. Um, but in all, in all sincerity, in all seriousness, this changed my life. The Jaffe coin on rally.io. Suddenly, I was living something that I'd actually written about 12 years prior in my book, Flip the Funnel. This idea of the tokenization of loyalty the tokenization of brands and branding. In fact, I had written in my book that I predicted that every single brand would have universal currency, currency that can be traded, that can be bought and sold, that has a value that can be exchanged, redeemed, held, gifted, can be used to buy goods and services and experiences. Nike would have a token called the swoosh. Coca-Cola would have a ribbon. Target would have a target or a bullseye, very much on brand. I had no idea, no idea whatsoever that individuals, personal brands, would actually beat the big corporates to the punch. And I also had no idea that crypto would be the method, that blockchain would use it. But I believe to this day, stronger than ever before, that we are going to see every single brand with some kind of tokenized expression of loyalty, whether it's NFTs, whether it's actually a token uh, or some kind of a branded coin as well. If I had to take it one step further, I actually believe that our children, when they're born, this is where you start to wonder what was in my coffee this morning. I actually think just like when our kids were born, we rushed some of us to get their dot coms or, you know, more recently to get their social media handles on Instagram or, or TikTok or whatever the case may be. Now I believe we will actually deliver or gift our children with their own brand 
standard token, their token that will allow themselves through a wallet to not only control their data, but control their destiny. Everything will come in and go out of this token, including allowances, including rewards, including bar mitzvah money, uh, wedding money, whatever the case may be. So this was the first thing that happened to me. I thought it was good, but it turned out to be kind of bad. Uh, I'm just kidding about that part. But here's the really bad stuff that did happen to me. I, um, I went for a physical. I turned 50. I went for a physical. And the doctor said, you're in great shape, except for the murmur. And I was like, murmur what? And they said, yeah, the murmur in your heart. You know the murmur. And I said, I have never met him or her or, or them. Um, turns out that I had a mitral valve prolapse with severe regurgitation, and I was completely asymptomatic. It actually meant that I needed open heart surgery, which I had, and then I developed complications. I ended up with a second surgery. I ended up with two, three skin infections, four, basically four hospital stays, three infections, two surgeries, and a partridge in a pear tree. Actually, no, COVID. Um, I've got a great video, by the way, of me eating an onion like it's an apple. Uh, apparently, with no taste and smell, you could do that. Again, I'm not that special. Most of you probably had it as well. But did you eat an onion is my question for you. Uh, so these two things happened, and it didn't change my mission. It didn't change my vision. In fact, I doubled down, and uh, I actually NFT'd myself. So you may think that I'm the physical perfect specimen. I'm in mean, the physical form right now. Uh, I'm actually just a hologram. I NFT'd myself. I guess this is probably what, the, what in my mind, NFTing yourself looks like. Uh, this is actually uh, how I NFT'd myself. Time to NFT myself. Uh, this maybe was a better idea in theory than actual practice. Help? Help? So from this moment on, why I said this may be my last uh, in-person keynote is from this moment on, you cannot buy my time. You cannot buy a speaking engagement. I no longer am available to transact through traditional means. The only way to work with me is through an NFT. Some people have said, that's really brave of you. I don't know that it's brave at all. Risk is relative. We can take calculated risks in life. What is risky to me may not be risky to you. We all know the beautiful sayings about risk. Peter Drucker, defending the past is far riskier than creating the future. Bill Burnback, safe advertising is the riskiest advertising of all. I don't feel like I've taken a risk at all. In fact, I'm looking forward to the return, which may take a while, but that's okay too. Now, I just want to be clear about something. I am not throwing out the baby with the bathwater right now. I haven't gone completely bonkers. You know, even though nothing that I do today or that I'll do tomorrow is like I did yesterday, there are other things in my life that give me unbelievable joy that are absolutely grounded in my core belief, in what I believe, like teaching at, at NYU. I love marketing. I am a proud card-carrying member of the Marketing Association. I believe in marketing, but at the same time, I also recognize that marketing is in an absolutely perilous place right now. We all know the data about CMOs and the tenure of a CMO. We all know the data uh, associated with the fact that, that the percentage of CMOs or marketers that have a seat at the boardroom is dwindling. We know that marketing has become marginalized, diminished, so to speak. The four Ps, which I actually believe are commoditized in many respects. Everything has been taken away and stripped away from marketing. But I actually, and I teach this as well, Regis McKenna once said, marketing is everything and everything is marketing. I believe anything and everything that touches your consumer is and should be marketing. And when we get into affiliate, that powerful click, that click, it's not a click, it's, a, it's, it's something clicking into place. It is a bridge. It is a connection point between funnels at the end of the day. How can that not be, not just marketing, but mission critical? So a lot of people believe that marketing is, in fact, dead, dying, has outlived its usefulness, has become marginalized. We ask, can the corporation save marketing? Can marketing be saved? But I actually flip that on its head, and I say, can marketing save the corporation? My fifth book is called Built to Suck, The Inevitable Demise of the Corporation and How to Save It. I believe, 
And in fact, I'll just go back one step. If you look at 5,000 years of history of civilizations, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Ming Dynasty, the Ottomans, Nazi Germany, if you look at every, I mean, quite frankly, the USSR, they're trying to return to it, or the EU with respect to Brexit, or even brand USA, what we realize and what we see, and that's with respect to, you know, factions and states uh, wanting to cede, etc. no one lives forever. No person, no civilization, no empire, no country, no brand lives forever. I love that idea. I think it actually keeps us grounded. It humbles us at the end of the day to kind of realize our time is limited, our time is finite. Let's make the most of our time here. People say you only live once. That's not true. You only die once. You live every single day. Make the most of it. And I actually believe that marketing holds the key to brands, to corporate survival and thrival. That's not really a, re a real word, but it is now. And I actually think the answer is it's easy as one, two, web, three. And I'll explain to you how. First of all, I want to take you back to the fact that, you know, remember the movie Top Secret when Val Kilmer is meeting all the uh, members of the French underground? And he meets someone called Deja Vu. And Deja Vu looks at him and goes, have we met before? Um, but <laughs> we just have to go backwards and realize that it, you know, <laughs> look at this one. I mean, this to me is the epitome. Internet may be just a passing fad as millions give up on it. I mean, can you believe this was a real article? I actually don't know if it was a real article. Maybe someone made this up. Maybe it's a meme as far as we're concerned. But every time that we've seen something new, something exciting, it could be digitization, it could be automation, it could be AI, it could be you know, augmented reality, it could be the metaverse, we typically look at it the same way. We typically judge it. We typically uh, push back the Gartner hype curve, if you will. And this to me grounds me, and it actually makes me realize that we are wasting time when we doubt ourselves, when we FUD ourselves, fear, uncertainty, and doubt ourselves. I was in Second Life in 2007. I had a company called Crayon. We didn't have a physical office. We didn't have a digital office, meaning a website. We had an island in Second Life called Crayonville. I had a penthouse suite. I had amazing art. We had a diner. We had a movie theater. We actually streamed a movie, a premiered a movie live in Second Life. We would conduct interviews in Second Life. We actually had a receptionist. The receptionist was one of us. We took turns. We had people in Europe. So we made sure that we had 24-7, 365 coverage sitting at the desk, at the reception desk in our office. And when anyone arrived on our island, they would teleport into the office and we'd immediately greet them. How's it going? Welcome. Is this your first time here at Crayonville? Can we show you around? Would you like to know about Crayon? Would you like to know about some of our services? That might look and seem a little silly or strange, but what if a website had a greeter? A greeter, hmm, I wonder if there's any precedent for greeters. Oh yes, Walmart, that worked out pretty well for them. Welcome to Walmart. How much time have you got? Can we help you with anything? And so what we were trying to do then was develop use cases. What we were trying to do then was be able to show and demonstrate a strategic role. And so one of the takeaways when I think about affiliate is we can look at it two ways. We can look at it at the bottom of the barrel or we can look at it as the cream of the crop, the cream that rises to the top. So we went into Second Life, we worked with Coke, we created, I thought, a, a pretty amazing program for them called Virtual Thirst. Coca-Cola is in 204 countries. It is the most ubiquitous brand in the world. It has the most reach, and Coke has a very simple, uh, very simple brief. We are everywhere where the consumer is. So if the consumer is in Second Life, then that's where we need to be too. But that presented a problem. We're kind of in the thirst business. We're in the quenching thirst business. Well, how do we quench thirst in a virtual world? Well, you can have a thirst for knowledge. 
You can have a thirst for meaning. You can have a thirst for connection. And so we created virtual thirst. And we said, if Coke were to be in Second Life, what would it dispense and how would it, just, how would it dispense it? So we had developers developing. I mean, there was one snow globe where you could actually hang out with the polar bears in the snow globe. You could shake it up, take a photo, and send it as a, as a postcard. The problem was that a journalist called me up and said, we're doing a piece on Second Life. Would you like to be interested? I mean, would you like to be interviewed for it? I said, of course I would. A little bit of, you know, everyone loves a little bit of narcissism in their life. Of course I want it to be. And they said, how would you feel about uh, introducing us to Coca-Cola, your client? I said, I would love to. And so we sat down together and they said, so uh, Second Life, could you take me into it? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, I've never actually been in it, but I've heard a lot about it. So I said, sure, let me show you around. Well, what preceded was one of the most beautiful sandbags that, could have, that you could have imagined, where we just got slaughtered. How, how Madison Avenue is wasting millions on a deserted second life. Media loves to turn. Media loves to turn, and we get burnt in the process. And so my point of view is simple. Don't waste time. Don't waste your time. Don't waste any time. Don't give up on what comes next. Don't give up on experimentation. Don't give up on innovation. Don't give up on something that doesn't have the reach yet. You create the reach. And by the way, a space that is deserted is also known as a blue ocean or a blank canvas where you can make it your own. I was once, um, I was on stage, uh, sorry to say this, Greg, but it was a Microsoft event, um, and Rex Briggs, remember Rex, he stood up and he went like this, and everyone was looking at him. He said, no, don't look at the finger. Look at where the finger's pointing. So where the finger is pointing is the future. Where if the finger is pointing is loyalty, is retention as the new acquisition, is customer obsession, is direct to consumer. But instead, we end up with what I call Groundhog Day in the metaverse. There's a different way to express it. It's known as SSDD which stands for same shit, different day. And I actually never worked out why smart people make dumb decisions, and more importantly, why new people come into jobs and make the same dumb decisions that their predecessors made. And then I realized the answer was actually in the statement, that what happens is we move on. Talent is the biggest challenge that businesses have today to be able to master. How do you attract? How do you retain? How do you engage? How do you maximize? How do you activate? And, and when it really works well, then we rotate people for some ridiculous reason, and we move them to China and, and, and Germany in order to get global experience. And so the next wave of people come in, and they make the same dumb decisions because we're just not very good at institutionalizing learnings and, and best practices. There's no incentive to do so. So because I am a masochist, I created the Alpha Collective, which essentially is a mastermind meets always on conference designed to bring together corporates and DGENs or creators, founders of Web3 based uh, communities to partner and win at the business of Web3. We started a virtual coffee called The Collective Cafe. You're all invited to it. It's free, Monday through Friday, 8 to 9 a.m. in Discord. You can have your hair in, uh, you know, in a scarf, in rollers. You, know, in, uh, you don't have to be wearing pants. Uh, it's all audio-based. And one of the first projects that we actually did in The Collective Cafe was to write my sixth book. I never thought I would write another book, but I did. I wrote it in three weeks, 53,000 words. The book is called Forever Changed, How a Global Pandemic Changed My Direction, My Purpose, and My Life. This is the cover of the book. Uh, it will, it's a video. It's a video cover of the book, uh, and it will be made into an NFT. Let me just show you uh, the video designed by an artist. That apparently is me. This book will be different. It will be the world's first book where readers actually get royalties. 
So for the very first time, customers will share in the royalties of the book. And I think this is the new model. I think this is the new model. The new model says that every single band, artist, customer, hell, if you're in the washing detergent business, why shouldn't your customers get royalties, get profits? Why shouldn't we create shared ownership and shared reward? This is the elevator pitch. This is the bottom line. When somebody says, explain Web3, I say it's simple. Shared ownership, shared reward. Can you see how we're getting closer and closer to the world of affiliate, where we're making sure that people are not getting lost in the cracks? We're making sure that every person that is responsible for referring business gets rewarded. The referrer, the referee. It's probably, I would argue, I might be biased because I'm standing here in front of you, but I don't say anything that I don't mean. It might be one of the most important, if not the most important part of the entire marketing ecosystem because it is the connection point between the traditional and the flip funnel. One way to think about it is, uh, you know, how it started, how it's going meme is this was the, I, I, I wrote this in, uh, in um, 2007, this, this chart. Uh, at the time, I called the one too many, the spray and pray, the shotgun approach. I called it the Dick Cheney approach because he just shot his friend in the face. Uh, I can't change it because, you know, like I suppose I could try and block it out as well. Um, this was replaced with one to one, right? A little bit of uh, let's go back to the future, one to one, relationship marketing, CRM, we all know that. Then we ended up with one from one, the world of search. Maybe the most fundamental change in marketing in our lifetimes until, I think, recent day, Web3, where suddenly it wasn't about push anymore, it was about pull. And then I said, you know, the social media world, because I was writing it at the time, was what I called the many-to-many -many model. Now, you're not meant to try and understand that. I might have been on some, uh, you know, hallucinogenic drugs at the time. But the bottom line is there's no format. It's moving, it's dynamic, it's changing. The customer's not in the middle you know, the, the brand is not in the middle, just conversation is going on. And, and, and I argued maybe we were moving back to the one too many, but this time now it was the consumer who was the person, you know, on Twitter when you, when you upset them or you piss them off or whatever the case may be. Now it was the consumer that was through their social media channels going out, you know, to their networks. But I actually think how it's going is we are now in what I call the sum to some model. I trademarked it, it's not really trademarked, but if you just do TM, you can trademark anything. Um, but this is now the new model that we're living in. All of these small communities coming together. And it's a problem for brands, because sometimes the community is a thousand, sometimes a ten, the Board Ape Yacht Club is 10,000 NFTs, but it's not 10,000 owners. So now suddenly it's a challenge, which is how do we get reach because we need reach, because without reach, we don't get to our quarterly earnings. We don't get our short-term gains that our external shareholders need and expect from us. But I'm here to tell you that the world is changing. We all know about the CEO roundtable, the business roundtable that says the primary function of a company is not solely to service its external shareholders, but in fact, all of its stakeholders as well. I believe that capitalism needs to evolve. In fact, I believe capitalism is evolving. I've had to update this slide now. You know, we see Ray Dalio and John Mackey and, you know, we see Lululemon in the news, but no one more so than the founder of Patagonia that literally just gave his company away to save this planet. I think we should just say, you're welcome. <laughs> like, Thank you, I suppose. You know, I don't, I'm not advocating being this extreme. I mean, you could have given half the company away. I would have given a quarter of the company away. But this is where the world is heading. In fact, what I call it is community capitalism. We is greater than me. Shared values, shared ownership, shared reward. This is the new marketing model. We all hear about purpose. There's purpose, shared values. It's not just the brand's purpose, it's all of our shared purposes. Employees, shareholders, stakeholders, customers, executives. Shared values, 
shared ownership, shared reward. So in order to tell you where it's going, let me take you once again back to the future. I came up with a very simple model. It's almost so simple, you'd be like, I cannot believe he's on stage right now and he's giving us such a simple model. The simple model is as, as follows. It's a two by two matrix. I get paid by the matrix. So, you know, uh, or I used to be as a consultant. Best, worst, old, new. That's, that's the model. The worst of the old, the best of the old, the worst of the new, the best of the new. Surprise, surprise, I'm gonna tell you to get rid of the worst of the old. The black hat, the bottom of the barrel, the coupons, you know, the affiliate marketers that give all of you a bad name. We're gonna lose that, we're gonna walk away, we're gonna move away from that. Maybe it's just the ante up. But at the end of the day, we're gonna think bigger. We're gonna think strategically. So we're gonna keep the best of the old. So there's already a tweak here. I'm not saying out with the old, in with the new. I'm actually saying keep the best of the old. Understand that, as I said, affiliate is ultimately the connection point between the traditional funnel, between the flipped funnel, and ultimately what I believe we will see is a badly tied boat, a bow tie. We will spend less on acquiring new customers because we are more efficient at doing so. We will invest more in retaining existing customers and using existing customers to gain new ones because it is more effective. We will absolutely grow our business from the inside out. By the way, you know, I appreciate the fact no one sat in the splash zone today, so you did well. Um, and this, to me, is the new marketing model. Now, let's talk about the worst of the new. I'm telling you to ignore the bells and the whistles and the fads and the, we need to be in the metaverse because meta just spent $10 billion on the metaverse. Maybe you don't because the metaverse kind of sucks at the moment. I know this because I was there in 2007. I wish I could go back to that as well. I believe that if marketers were given the goose that laid the golden egg, they would basically slaughter it and cook it on the grill. So here's a quick hint. Recurring revenue is much more powerful than a one-off, you know, than a one-off windfall as well. So sometimes what we do is we look at what's new, we look at what's next, and we try and replicate it. We try and force fit it into an existing container. But oftentimes it is a square peg trying to be put into a round hole. So what I am more interested in is this, the best of the new. I'm more interested in how we can see NFTs absolutely transforming loyalty, advocacy, referrals, um, you know, uh, affiliate marketing, how blockchain will ultimately change the entire ecosystem, universal customer ID. The fact that you can actually walk into an H&M store and immediately you can cut the line or you can go to a dedicated checkout counter because you have that NFT on your phone. I call it not Web3, but WebMe, where we, you, us, our, control our data and therefore control our destiny. So to me, this is the beginning of what I would call affiliate three. Now to be clear, I'm not necessarily saying it's 3.0. It doesn't have to be blockchain enabled. It doesn't have to be Web3 enabled. I'm living in the space right now. I've NFT'd myself, you know. So like, I, I can't break out. It's Hotel California. You can check in anytime you want, but you can never leave. But what I'm here to say to you is too often in times, too often at times, we've given up too soon. We've abandoned ship. We, we felt the pressure. Our chairman or chairwoman or chairperson said, great and all, but how many leads did we get? How many clicks? How many email signups? How many ROIs did we get at the end of the day? But I actually think affiliate three, the what comes next, Remember, the best of the old combined with the best of new. Where in Affiliate 3, every member of the ecosystem 
has not only social capital, but social currency, maybe even actual currency. Everyone is recognized and rewarded and immortalized immutably on the chain. I believe, and we've heard this many times, it's something I think I actually got from Partnerize, I love it, that affiliate broadens the winner's circle. You see, the idea behind shared values, shared ownership and shared reward, first of all, we've seen it with millennials, we've seen it with Gen Z, that they will not buy from a company that doesn't share their values. They will not work necessarily for a company that doesn't share their values. And it doesn't have to be as lofty as selling the whole company, but that is a North Star. And at a very minimum, we can see it in the sky and we can triangulate our own path. And I'm using analogies of stars and analogies of, of, of you know, plants uh, and, and natural you know, miracles uh, very intentionally. Affiliate broadens the winner's circle. We can give up a little bit to gain a lot. We can give up a little bit short term to gain so much long term, including growth, including customer intimacy, and including competitive advantage. We can take a small step back in order to take and make a giant leap into the future. We've seen too many, too many incompetent CEOs exiting in their golden parachute. And the world is watching and the world is paying attention. You hold the keys to the future because you hold the key that unlocks a magical box. And inside that box lives your customer. So I want to kind of wind down with a couple of thoughts that brings me back to my journey to be forever changed. And it is my wish that you join me on this journey to change forever for the best. It doesn't mean having a Jerry Maguire moment like some of you might think I've had. You don't have to NFT yourselves or even your brand. But ultimately, as Yogi Berra once said, if you come to a fork in the road, take it. Now, we all know that wonderful saying that says, if I'd known then what I know now, I probably wouldn't have done it. So I, I changed that. I hacked it. I said, if I had known then what I know now, I would have started sooner. I would have started a year before. And I, wouldn't, and I won't give up, and nor should you. Don't give up. Don't give up on this. Don't give up on the ability to take your best practices of what you've done before and combine it with the innovation, with the automation, with AI, with all of this incredible new technology, but always grounded by the fundamentals of surprising, delighting, Promise it. I don't say under promise and over deliver. I say promise and deliver. Just do what you say and then surprise and delight. I believe that it is in my hands. It is in your hands. It is in your hands. It is in our hands. We have the power. You showed up today. And by showing up today, the people that showed up in person, some of you might still be, you know, you're already practicing the X's on me, right? Some of you might be a little kind of like, this is new to me. This, this feels, you know, kind of unfamiliar. I even felt a little nervous today, which I haven't felt in a long time, mainly because I thought I was going to the wrong building, but still, you know. So it's in our hands. It's up to us. We showed up, and that is nine-tenths of the battle. So I want to leave you with just a couple of thoughts going back to the humanity side of the business. Um, I had um, Ray Higdon on the show, and we spoke about the fact that, that the reason why generally people fail or businesses fail or companies fail or brands fail is because of human beings that got in their own way. How often have you seen that? It doesn't matter how great the idea is. It doesn't matter how great the execution is. It's people that get in their own way. It's politics. It's dysfunction. It's, you know, it's the inability sometimes to take our ego out of the equation. I'm sure you've all heard this saying as well, the best time to have planted an oak tree was 20 years ago. Well, the second best time is today. What will you do differently tomorrow? What will you do different, differently right now? What will you take back to your office and be able to say, we're on 
the right track. I'm more determined. I'm more uh, confident and resolute than ever before that we are on the right track. And guess what? There might even be a better path out there. Stay the course. I came up with a very simple idea in terms of the formula for forever change. The book basically says it shouldn't have to take a global pandemic for you to change your life, but it helps. You shouldn't have to be laid off to wake up. You shouldn't have to have a global pandemic allow you to say, let me make the most of my time on this planet that Patagonia is saving. What if there was a formula? There is a formula. Love what you do, be true to yourself and stay the course. That's the formula. Love what you do, be true to yourself and stay the course. I can tell you, you know, I've spoken to hundreds of thousands of people throughout my career, but when I am with my people, we're talking retention, we're talking loyalty, we're talking advocacy, we're talking affiliate. We're talking about recognizing and rewarding, not taking our customers for granted, not exploiting them, not being lazy, but figuring out how we can share the wealth, broaden the winner's circle. And so I want to leave you today with one of my favorite little Corona bites uh, from the show. This was Daniel Gutierrez. He was a very accomplished keynote speaker and life coach, and he burnt literally all of his certificates. He destroyed and sold all of his awards, and he went to Peru, and, and he does mindfulness training uh, over there. Um, I just want to play to you that little clip. There are these reminders all around us all the time, but are we paying attention? Are we alive? Are we awake? Are we able to see the signs as they present themselves versus being blind? That was pre-COVID. I remember doing an event. I was a speaker at Mercedes-Benz, and there was this beautiful, beautiful yellow tree. It was the only one that was in the fall on campus right before you come into the building. And I remember asking 400 people, what's the most beautiful thing on your drive into campus? Not one person said that yellow tree because nobody saw it. Nobody saw it. They were too busy trying to get to their office. And I said, when you leave today, look at the beautiful yellow tree. It's an example of how you're missing out on life by not being present. I just loved, I love that idea of being present. I heard that people that have hatred in their lives are living in the past. People that have fear in their lives are living in the future. People that are, that are at peace are absolutely living in the present. They are present. And I want to thank partner. I want to thank, uh, my, I want to thank Matt. I want to thank the folks over at Partnerize. And I want to thank you, all of you, and all of you uh, for your presence today. And I wish you uh, an exciting uh, conference, a fulfilling conference, and I look forward to networking with you like this or like this at the end. Thank you so much.